Hello, hello, happy Tuesday. Let's see, let's get Cassandra in here. I need to turn my volume. Oh, hey. I don't know why. Hi. My camera. Hey, Sarah. We're not working. Um. Hi. Oh, hey, Melanie. Moment. Hey, Brandy. You guys excited? Hi, Nicole. Good evening. Hope everybody's doing well. This is so exciting. Oh, you're headed home from the lake. Is that better? Did it work? Yeah. You look lovely. Thank you. So do you. Bright red lipstick. I love it. Thank you. Um, it's it's like a nice sunny day. I've got like a little, little cocktail with me. See, I wondered if you were going to have rosé. So yeah, I have my glittery, my glittery Prosecco. I wonder if Elsie's going to have any Prosecco. Oh, you've got glitter in yours. Mm. I do. <laughs> Hi, Brady. Yeah, I had um, to put I, some glitter I thought in about it. getting rosé, but then everything at the store that I, because I didn't go to the grocery store. We just have like a little convenience store that's really close by. And all of their bottles were like room temp. And I'm like, Oh, something chilled. I need it extra cold. Yeah, I'm like I don't almost have time to this. I, I didn't prepare. <laughs> oh, you just finished Reckless this morning. Oh, uh, are you just still riding on that high? It's so good. <laughs> hey, Annette. Yeah, I loved it so much. I did too. An easy five stars. Easy. Hey, Jessica. <laughs> oh, hi, Jessica. Yes, everybody needs a Theo in their life. I agree. Truly. Truly. He was fantastic. What a great character. I know. There's like almost nothing wrong with him. <laughs> I know. Not in a way that was like, oh, he's too perfect, you know? Yeah. Like he was just human enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had his... Um, I mean, he had his moment, right? Where he... Yeah. His, like, five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Turned off his phone. Just checked out. Yeah. And you know what? She wasn't having it. She was not. I, I really liked like, that. Uh, unlike last time, I'm coming for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Hello, hello. So what did you do today? I went to the pool today. Ooh. We have a neighborhood pool, so I did that for a little bit and got a little work done this morning. I had to do some carpool stuff with the kids. Thank you. Yeah. What about you? I mean, you had to work some this afternoon, right? Yeah. Um, I just worked at the salon and, you know, I, I came home and I filmed a few TikToks and I... I read a little bit more of QB's book that I just got. That's right. Yep. She is still near the top of my TBR of an author I have not yet read, but really want to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, at the beginning of the year, I had a list of authors that I intentionally wanted to read this year. And Candy Steiner was one of them. And Pam Godwin was one of them. Candy's on my list, too. Maybe JT Geisinger was on but, and I've read, I've read all of them. I think there was a few more. can't remember. Cause there were authors that I had never read before that I wanted to like pop my cherry with. And then there was authors who I wanted to read more of. Oh yeah. Yeah. Candy Steiner. I, um, I'm excited to meet her. Oh, there's Elsie. She's going to be at Bonanza. Oh, started the architect. Mm, that's, that's a fun one. That's a ride. <laughs> oh, yeah, enjoy. Hold on. How do I? And that was me too. I'm like, what happened to my camera? Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, gorgeous. Oh, I love your dress. Oh, it's actually just a shirt. 
Oh, well, yeah. it's a super oh, cute shirt. <laughs> better. It's reckless colored. I saw it and I was like, I have to have it. <laughs> well, it's perfect. I love that. And I love that your tradition of getting your nails done. Uh -huh. I started like, well, okay. I started off doing it myself. Whoa, this is, my skin's very shiny. Um, But I started off doing it myself and then I started getting my nails done. So I always go like the day before or the day of to like, to match i think the yeah. only one that kind of killed me was a photo finish was yellow and i was like Ooh, i don't know if i would normally like pick yellow nails but yeah yeah, yeah. so yellow I might be my least favorite color when it comes to clothing or yeah accessories it's about your complexion right it's just yeah it's totally. i'm too fair the brunette is just not it's not good i got them done like this high visibility yellow the other day that was like super neon and that was kind of a fun one yeah um, because, just because it was bright enough that it like kind of worked but yeah so are you drinking anything fun or is that just water it's just water I feel like I celebrated quite a bit over the weekend. <laughs> oh shit, are you guys drinking? <laughs> well, yeah, I was I was wondering if maybe you would have some champagne or Prosecco with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm here. You know, I should go get some. And I put some glitter in it because you have you to have can. glitter. <laughs> I still haven't bought that yet, but I need to. Mm -hmm. I put like so I'm ready. Oh yeah, yeah. It makes drinking so much more fun. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hello. Are we are we drinking? Yeah. Is drinking yeah. happening? That sounds great. Yeah. Apparently. Joe, do you put glitter in your drinks? No. Uh <laughs> no. Ruin his whiskey but, right now? <laughs> um I will uh I will fuck around with some Goldschlager. Uh oh. so I don't mind I don't mind gold I don't mind gold flex in my booze. <laughs> The first time my husband got drunk in high school, it was at like a, a dubious party that his like middle of nowhere high school put on at a house and he drank like a whole bottle of Goldschlager. Oh. When he was, like maybe 14 or 15. Oh. <laughs> I remember even when we were young and we were just friends, he, I was always his like drunk phone call. So he like could barely talk and his friend is like dragging him in the house and he's just like, Cassandra. Hi, it's like two in the morning. I'm like, what are you doing? Call. I'm like, is something wrong? Are you okay? He's like, no, you're just, you're so cool. You're just like my best friend. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, I'm so friend is like, I'm sorry, Cassandra. He's fine. We just got him home. Go back to bed. Does he drink it now? That's the real question. Oh, he does not. Yeah. No, it's me and Jaeger. Yeah, he did throw oh, up a bunch of gold flakes <laughs> the next day. That's what those uh those young 21 20 year olds get into the Goldschlager and my husband has gotten in trouble with Goldschlager. What is it I definitely about? remember having a lot of conversations about whether or not the gold flex were like going to cut your stomach lining. Everyone's like you you can't drink the gold. I'm like I'm pretty sure they couldn't sell this if it was okay. ripping our stomachs open. He yeah, says Take a delicious cinnamon shot. Wait, are you are you drinking? I always like pouring hot uh, fireball. Uh, I do actually. I I need to make this uh, disclaimer and be very clear that this oh. is a stage of my drinking that I have very effectively grown out of. Mm -hmm. uh, the audio attic. Uh, I've heard the audio attic. They're they are massive fans of fireball and i do want everyone to know if uh you ever catch me at a bar we have an opportunity to uh break bread or raise a glass together uh please do not ever purchase me a shot of fireball uh does that happen I do not, often? well it will i the the very first live event i did in lexington uh the attic fan was at a bar and i popped in and they were like you have to do fireball shots and i was like i do not actually um <laughs> I'm a, I'm a grown man. I no longer need to play any kind of drinking game. I do not need an excuse to drink. I do not need a reward for drinking. And I will not drink anything that I do not want. That's right. Yeah. So. As, as you shouldn't. That's right. Yeah. It's like, I, yeah. Even, even, even when people were playing drinking games, I was always like, I, drinking is not a game to me. Like, I take this very seriously. And I do it when I want to do it. And I don't yeah. need encouragement. <laughs> Yeah. Right. 
I was always so terrified of getting sick. So I could not oh. be talked into doing things like that. I bartended uh, for a really long time, so I've seen it all. <laughs> really? I bet you have. I was the person giving you the fireball. <laughs> oh, in Canada too. Like a lot of people in the United States, they like go to Canada for their 18th birthday because they yeah. can drink. And... Yeah. I was bartending at 18. Yeah. Really? Oh, I loved, I, I bartended as well. I thought that I would not enjoy bartending and I actually really enjoyed it. I um, loved it. It was, it was like being at the party, but like, you didn't feel like shit the next day. You got all the fun, fun money and the people, so. Even if, even if people were like buying me shots or if I was drinking, uh, like I never, yeah, I never got, I never got really fucked you're up. There's something about like, right? yeah, you're, like you're, you're yeah. and the best part was if you're waiting tables, you're kind of stuck with that table. You have to keep going back. But if you're behind that bar, you're kind of running the whole show. And if somebody's bothering you or you don't want to talk to somebody, somebody's giving you a weird vibe, you can set a drink down and move to some other part of the bar. And uh, mm -hmm. I was very empowered by that. So I always felt like if you were serving, you had to be nice to people. But if you were bartending, you could kind of be a dick. Like my thing was if somebody waved cash at me, they were done. Like I would go to the other end of the bar and start there. Like, do not wave your cash at me. Um, but you just develop these weird little things. And yeah, you could. It was like, where else are they going to go to get a drink? I guess somewhere else, right? Have, have any of your bartending uh, tales found their way into your written tales? Yes. Um, mostly a little bit, but probably the next book. The heroine is a bartender, so... Um, I'll be able to weave a couple really, oh man, I could write, I could probably write an entire book about bart. I mean, if you've bartended, you know, you could write an entire book just about things that happen. So many bar. stories. Yeah, for sure. Do so you have any, um, the were there any, like, did you have like any back pocket tricks, uh, any drinks you loved to make or hated to make? Um, you know, I worked at, it was like a billiards, well, it was a billiards bar, but it was like kind of billiards on the weeknights and then it would get packed on the weekends. Um, so it was like a slightly older crowd, um, a little bit more mellow, like there was no dance floor. Um, so it was a lot of like beer and highballs mostly, I would say. Um, we didn't do a lot of like specialty drinks, but now it's like Negronis or old fashions. Like now we enjoy making the drinks at home or like Tiffany and I have talked about the like egg white froth that you can put on top. I feel like over COVID we were like, well, we're stuck at home. We might as well make cool drinks. <laughs> so I feel like I do more like fancy bartending now than I did when I was young. Yeah. How about you? Someone says, why can't people just be nice to servers? That's the biggest. I feel thing. like serving or working in a bar or restaurant should be like a required class. Like if you're going to graduate high school, you need to go work in the service industry mm -hmm. so that you don't go out into the world a dick. <laughs> like, yeah. There is, there, there is nothing more humbling than uh, a, a year waiting tables or bartending. I mean, I spent way more than a year doing both of those things. But uh, for me, the person that, that trained me, to bartend her secret was if you're ever unsure of the cocktail that you've made or the drink that you're supposed to make uh splash a sprite she's like whatever you're making just add a splash of sprite and it'll probably mask whatever you didn't know about that drink i don't know i don't know about that <laughs> um maybe that's have you nice. have you ever have you read uh any anthony bourdain writing like uh, no reservations or and i've watched oh. every actually i haven't watched as many since that was like maybe the celebrity death that hit me the hardest i still am not okay <laughs> uh hard hard agree there uh that one just left a gaping hole for me and um because he, he struck me as a character that seems when I say character, I just mean a human being, a person so empathetic. And what was so wonderful about his writing and that show was his ability to connect to people wherever they were. He always met everyone where they were. And his lyrical writing about the people that worked in the kitchens at some yeah. of the fanciest restaurants in New York. Um, there's a passage of like a, 
one of the fry cooks, his job was just to like pull the French fries for their uh, palm frites, this fancy dish, the $60 steak thing that's really just finally a cut of beef and some French fries. And he talks about the calluses that this man had on his fingers, his ability to pull French fries out of 450 degree boiling oil and throw them down on that plate so that by the time it gets out there, it's as hot as it can be. That simple human connection of seeing somebody's value, their worth, what they bring to the table. He always figured that out. And um, yeah, and so it, again, I think folks that like spend their time or their life like being waited on or being served uh, miss an opportunity to be reminded that like you're a person like everybody else and yeah. a little humility well, goes I a long think, way. I think that TV show because of the way he is like if you followed along with it and you it almost felt like you traveled the world with him like or i felt like that like i felt like i was there and like knew him i mean clearly i didn't um but yeah there was something like that was deeply connected with him for sure Whoa. the sun in my office is out of control right now. yeah i know i'm like <laughs> i was like i need here. sunglasses i'll do my best joe arden imitation just kidding <laughs> There, that's better. Okay. Uh, during peak pandemic, there was a lot of great Joe Arden looks uh, floating around, uh, especially like Northeast winter pandemic year, tons of like beanie glasses and the face masks. I was here for all of it. I enjoyed it. I love that. That was like pre me being aware of you. <laughs> Same. Yeah. I was, gonna, I was going to... I was going to describe that time in your life as uh, your BJ period, but then I realized that might get taken another way. I'm married. Yes. I'm married. Every BJ period. Okay. Well, that, that was your before Joe. Uh, you'd be... <laughs> oh, I love it. That's great. I love that. But you know what? My life is enhanced now that, you know, I'm... I'm in it. Post Joe. Um, uh, my my life is also enhanced now that you're in it. Uh, it was a, a true delight to get to meet you. Uh, uh, it feels like it was yesterday. It should have been yesterday. Um, really? I can't believe it's already really, been just over a week. Thank you so much for making that effort, like getting yourself to LA for such a short amount of time. And I know, and, and here's the thing I, um, uh, that I love actually the most about that whole trip is that it wasn't about me. And I'm here for that most of all. I see what you were really celebrating is it was your opportunity to meet Tiffany and Sarah um, and so many of the folks that I talked to that weekend uh, yeah. told me, you know, thank you for bringing this community together, which I'm not sure what I necessarily have to do with that exactly, but I'm so I'm so buoyed by that. I'm so uplifted by this idea that like, you know, hey, like Joe's going to throw a party, like let's all get together because it's, it's an excuse for us to get together. Right. That's yeah. awesome. So it was a great party too. I loved it. The themed stuff was fun. The like location was swanky and everyone was so kind. And yeah, I just, I loved Happy it. To be there. Did you see Elsie, Elsie, uh, I want you to steal this idea for a future uh, book event that you have. Uh, my f my team made everything was handmade, all the like sort of uh, decorative elements to this party. Oh, great. well, the thing that may have been overlooked is that the centerpieces uh, were these like flower displays that were made from pages of the chameleon effect yes. and each table actually had a chapter number and they had used the pages from that chapter to make these flowers and i just thought that was the coolest thing it was so and beautiful they had, like little chili pepper <clears throat> lights and then it was so cute. yeah that's so crafty i love it mm -hmm. Uh, and then I got to, uh, I got to do the thing that I was, it may have been the highlight of the evening for me, actually. Uh, I forget who, but somebody came up to me right before everybody was leaving and they're like, Hey, you have to like help get everybody out of here. Cause we're way past when we should have left anyway. Also, can you tell folks if they want that they can take the centerpieces? And I had a mom growing up who 
would never attend a large function without figuring out how, if, and what stealthy way she could take a centerpiece home. Oh. <laughs> like my brother and I, it was basically like if we had to go to a wedding or like, you know, uh, an anniversary party or a bar mitzvah or any kind of, you know, a sweet 16, whatever it was, it was like, if, if mom is coming, you know that we're going to be walking out with a giant bouquet of flowers <laughs> that we weren't gifted. And uh, so it was really great for me to, I hopped on the mic at the end of the night and I was like, uh, my mother would be really thrilled for me to announce that we want you to take the centerpieces. Uh, I would have so. taken one if I had lived there. I know, there, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Fly home, I would have taken a centerpiece for sure. So Joe, we're going to do it again in like six months, right? Is that enough time uh, to do it yeah. again? Listen, listen, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we I, we have already had my team and I have already had a discussion about uh, what an event like that might look like a couple times a year. In the um, it was such a celebration of this audiobook community um, and romance in a really positive way. The show itself was really fun. I would I would pay money just to get a chance to talk to Teddy like that again. Um, Aww. and I think, I mean, I do think we could do, I think the answer is yeah, probably <laughs> in six months. Yeah. I'll let you know where, and we'll do it again. I love you and Sounds Teddy good. together. The way that you riff off of one of each other, it's so brotherly. Like you guys are just so hilarious together and you can tell that you guys hang and it's just great. Your chemistry is wonderful. Teddy does he, that, that we come by that. Honestly, I feel, uh, connected to him like a, a brother he's yeah. uh he's Don't my forget. he's my work he's my work brother <laughs> like you know you have, you have work wives or work husbands he's my work brother I love it. uh <clears throat> and uh yeah, I he's and just such a good dude. It happened again, everybody. I don't know what to do about it. I just before this live, I logged in and I have once again been tagged in a very wonderful Zade Meadows <laughs> haunting Adeline post. <laughs> now it's just going to be like a thing that people do ironically because like they know. Uh, somebody jumped in there and was like, "Daddy Joe really kills it," and I was like, "Listen." I I might have, but but uh, <laughs> Uncle Uncle Ted really brought the thunder on this one. So oh, Uncle that's, Teddy, that's what you call him. That's so that funny. is that's so funny you say that because I do call him Uncle Teddy because when I first saw what he looked like in real life, I was like taken aback. I actually told him this at the party too. He looks just like my uncle, who I'm very close to, whose name is Peter, and like we hang. We're we're very tight. And I, as soon as it happened, I was like, no, I had to like dissociate <laughs> because I love the narrator and he was great at like dirty, smutty filth. And I love his talent in that, but I cannot picture my Uncle Peter when that happened. So I'm like, okay, now that I know he looks like my uncle's doppelganger, we can't <laughs> picture <laughs> what he looks like. Yep. Yeah, but he's, he's so good that it's not hard to like right. just picture the characters that he's playing. So uh, and I and that's one of the reasons that I love the mask actually is the just like that continued permission to let listeners engage in their own imagination. Um yeah. like I was talking to uh, a friend of mine recently about the difference between reading a book and watching television. And I was like, well, like one of them is active and the other one is passive. Like mm -hmm. when you read and, and I say listening is reading as well. So it's the same thing. Um, but when you're doing that, you're actively engaging with a story, which is to say that you are, you have to use your imagination to bring that story out in your own mind. And so the experience is extremely personal. It is one on one. Elsie, I don't know how you feel about this as far as like knowing that you wrote something, but then when some and each and every person consumes it, they are bringing it to life in their own minds in some unique and specific way to them. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if you uh, you take Bridgerton, for example, something that started as a book and then became a TV show or movie, you may love the film series or the, you may think it's great. But the fact is, once they cast those people, they become physically real in a way that your imagination can now no longer work around. And you see what some people say sometimes, they're like, well, that's not my, um, what are the heroes' names in those books? The Anthony, and we'll say, 
you're like, oh, that's not how I pictured him. Right. Well, that's because somebody else has just done the picturing for you. So now you're a passive person. You're just speaking the story rather than engaging with the story. And um, that's why I have always loved books. And that's why I love audiobooks because it adds that performative element without taking away from your imaginative engagement with the material. And it is also why I think hiding my face helps enforce and allow for more of that. Yeah. Somebody agreed. I get stuff all the time that's like, you know, Elsie, this is like exactly how I imagine Jasper or Kate or whoever. And I'm like, wow, they are so far off base, but good for like, for what I have in my head. It's like the wrong hair color, like not even close, but I mean, that's what's that, like to them. It was so exciting to find that person that embodied the character for them. Um, so yeah, I totally well, I want to know Elsie, when you pick your narrators for your characters, like yeah. how do you go about, is it just like a feeling you get when you hear audition tapes? Do you have narrators in mind? like way early on like what was it about joe and savannah that like just made you feel like oh, okay this is theo and winter yeah so i think for me it's a little bit different before i started um writing and kind of then getting to the point where i was like okay i can you know afford to even produce an audiobook um i was not an audiobook listener so oh you have a little <laughs> No, how to go on. Anyways, um, but I so I wasn't really listening to books. Um, I have been fortunate enough to have um like an author mentor turned friend who is very active in audio, so she was a huge help. But um, I haven't done auditions. I just started listening like a lot. Like it's almost replaced my reading. Um, and kind of. Um, picking, there are strategic parts of it for me too. Like if I see, you know, I know that people search by a narrator's name. So I'm like, okay, if this hooks me up with comparable authors or people who I think might like my books too, then that's like a strategic, a strategic choice or age wise. Um, and also because it's dual narration and not duet, I, I, I like specifically go listen to how you know, their female voices or how their male voice is. Um, so, and then just personal preference. Like it's so, um, it's so individual and it varies from person to person. Like I can be like, oh, this one narrator has like my favorite voice and a really close friend of mine is like, really? And then we like swap, like her least favorite is my favorite and my least favorite is her favorite. And like, it's, it just totally, I don't know. I think it's just so subjective. Um, so I'm really still here trying my best. I'm so new to it, but I'm having a lot of fun. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, Reckless was my favorite of the series and they were all five stars to me. I mean, all of your books have been so incredible. And I also wanted to let everybody know, we did reach out to uh, Savannah to invite her to be here and she was not able to join us tonight, so. So I make sure everybody was aware of that. Can you please yeah. say, can you play, can you please say, uh, Sav Savannah Peachwood, uh, declined to be, uh, declined to comment for this interview. <laughs> like she's, she's the, like, she's the, um, major corporation that the news article is about. She's like, we reached out to, uh, AOL declined to Savannah comment. Peachwood declined to comment. Yeah, declined to comment. <laughs> That's so funny. I love how this is so random too. Her profile picture is just like the color peach, it's just like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, Savannah was in one of the first audiobooks I listened to, and when I emailed her to thank her for doing this project, um, I told her that. But also her her like intonation, even just with like kind of a snarky remark or I don't, if, if she just feels very conversational to me. So I, I do really love her voice. So I was excited. I mean, I started this and then it was like, <laughs> my producer's like, we can only book them like so far out. And I was like, oh man, I'm such an only child. I'm like, what do you mean? We can't do this now. So um, I had to like wait a little bit to put everybody together, but um, yeah, she's definitely a favorite of mine. Um, really happy. Yeah. Elsie, may I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. 
I guess I should also ask Tiffany if I'm allowed to ask a question. Of course. Only if you okay. raise your hand. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm raising my hand. You yeah. should see it. It's up right now. Um I noticed when the when Reckless came out, first of all, how quickly there were a million reviews for the audio and the book. But the through line that I'm seeing in all the user reviews is how much people just adore this universe that you've created here. And I wonder if you either were aware that you were creating something really special when you were working on it, or if you know what it is about this space, this community, this series, that again, one of the comments that I saw was something like, I Elsie can keep writing like this forever. I they, um. it it's it's honest and pure and wholesome and sexy and interesting and personal and specific. Do, like all of them. Uh had how'd you do it? <laughs> <laughs> What's your secret? I feel like I spent every to figure that out. Um I'm still like just very overwhelmed by how much things have changed in the last year. Um, and I think I've actually been working with a writing coach a little bit or success coach or whatever, just to deal with like the um, kind of like emotional and mental like changes that happened so quickly for me. Um, and she has said to me, like, the only thing, like, you can't write the same book over and over again. You can't guarantee the same success every time. The only thing that you can replicate is the way you felt when you wrote that book or the kind of the feeling or the circumstances that you were in when those words hit the page. So I think I've been working really hard on protecting, like, that part of, of like, my mental health or game um but i don't know what it is i don't know um so do you have any rituals that you go to before you write because it, it sounds like you're talking about the space you need to be in to write are there things you do to yeah find I, or recreate that space i so i even though my son is in school now um like i was like oh i'll have so much time i won't i i started off writing um like i get up at like five or quarter to five so that i can I can write before anybody gets up. I love to have my coffee. The house is quiet. Like my dogs aren't up yet. It's just peaceful. Um, and I thought for sure when he started school that I would stop doing that. But I just, that is like my magic hour. Like I can get a crazy amount of words in and it just like flows. Like I put my headphones in, I listen to Brain FM and I can spend an entire afternoon or mid morning, like just <laughs> feels awful. But if I get that morning time in and I don't go on social media, if I start the scroll, I'm fucked. Like I'm yeah, so fucked. Same. Um, but so just like protecting that space. And I think that, I think that um, sometimes people ask me like, oh, would you ever, you know, write in a different setting? Because both my series so far are set in Canada. Um, and I mean, I live in Canada. And I think there's something kind of magical about that. Because um, so many people and like, you know, 90% of my reader base is American. Um, and I think it feels a little bit like an escape. Like they're like, send me a picture of what it looks like or the mountains or this. Um, and to me, it's not that impressive. Like Candy Steiner is a good friend of mine and she was just in Banff, um, which is not far from where I was born. And she was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I was like, what? The beaches in Florida look incredible. But I think that that like being transported to something somewhere a little bit different. Um, and then like the family vibes. I feel like everybody came out of COVID and it was like, people were not as happy as they like maybe thought they were. And I think that like anything that feels like warm and happy and a little bit funny and a little bit real, it's just a comfort to people. Um, and what else? I think the other thing that people have messaged me about a lot is, and personally, I don't like reading books about perfect people. Like my characters sometimes make a bad decision or say the wrong thing or don't make the choice that like I would make or you would make or somebody else would make. But um, I think they always kind of like come out on top in the end. And I like taking them through that sort of rigmarole or 
out of a shitty situation into a better one. I mean, Theo was pretty perfect, though. Theo was like one of the more perfect characters. I was like, you know what? I'm so sick of grumpy, broken boys. I want a real, <laughs> I want, I want I a real nice that. guy. I'm ready. I love like three top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my Tiffany. I married one there. of those. He's so. a dirty he's, talking he's cinnamon he's roll. Fun. He was mm -hmm. fun for me. He was, and you know what? Like in real life, everybody, I got asked on a podcast, fuck, Mary kill for the first three heroes in the no, series. How could you? And they were so mad when I said kill Cade. <laughs> but I was like, listen, I don't like grumpy men in real life. Like I, I literally would kill him because I would be like, why are you scowling at me? Like, no. Um, so I think that they yeah, always I would just, be like, why are you scowling at me? Like, no. Um, so I think that yeah, Theo is just like, why are you scowling at me? Like, uh -oh. no. Um, Wait. so I think that Theo is just like, why are you scowling at me? Like, uh -oh. no. Um, Wait. so I think that Theo is just like, why are you scowling at me? Like, uh -oh. no. What's happening? Um, so I think that Theo is just like, what did we do? What happened? What happened? How do we fix it? Do you have to get off and get back on? Maybe. Hey, Elsie, why don't you go out and come back? Because it started while you were talking. Hey, Elsie, why don't you go out and come back? Because it started while you were talking. Okay. It did have something to do with Elsie, I think. <laughs> Joe, can you hear me? Hi. Okay, there's not a loop. Can you hear me? Yes, we're good. Okay, let's bring them back. It's, uh, so it's just, it's just you and me now, Tiffany. It is. Whatever will we chat about. You guys, I think that was totally so my bad. Your microphone sounds really nice tonight, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I got a phone call, and as soon as I like edited out of the phone call, it started echoing out. So, oh, I'm phone sorry. calls mess these lives up. Where is Elsie? Truly, I just I uh, put my I put my thing on Do Not Disturb for these. I yes, the I have to as well. There she is. Didn't know that you could do that. Good yes. job, Cassandra. Nikki, you know what? Kiss my tush. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm so sorry. Okay. I, didn't, I was like, what did I do? I said, I never think that happened. That was, no, that was wild. <laughs> I mean, it was out of my control, but still, I mean, I'll put my phone on Do Not Disturb now. Listen, we've all changed locations in the visual that I have right now, and that is actually messing with me more than anything else. <laughs> I feel like I've entered an alternate reality. I know. I know. There was a shift. <laughs> How does the top right corner feel, Joe? Well, it is nice to be on top. <laughs> Just waiting for it. <laughs> you didn't have to wait long, no, did you? No, I did not. I did not. I knew as soon as that mm -hmm. comment came out, you were going to fire back. It's perfect. <laughs> so, um, Joe. Oh, no, sorry, Cassandra, did you want to say something? No, I just was like, so what were we saying? <laughs> I was just rambling about my we character. We were talking about the oh, character. Really interrupted. So, Joe, I know you have talked a lot about the importance in prepping a book. And so with characters like Theo or any other character that you prepare for, do you, as an actor, do you have to take time to really try to get into those characters' mindset when you're prepping? Or when you are prepping a book, are you really just trying to get the full emotional scale of the story? And then as you start narrating, you kind of help those personalities come to life. I, uh, I, I studied in New York with uh, Terry Schreiber and uh, Terry is a, a wonderfully kind and open soul and would draw a lot of incredible work out of the actors that studied with him. And he, took me aside at one point and he was like, we have this one exercise that most folks do and it's really to like help unleash their emotional vulnerability. And the work you've done so far indicates to me that that's not the area that you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. 
So when I prep a book, I'm actually not really interested in the emotional journey at all. I am interested in making sure that I know enough about the characters to give them voice effectively. And the problem with not prepping the book is that there are so many clues about the way somebody might talk that come up in parts of the scene that may have nothing to do with the actual description of their voice. Um, what part of the country or world somebody is from, how tall they are, uh, the kind of clothing that they wear. There's so many things. Are they an only child? Are they the oldest child? Like there's so many things that can be informative when it comes to giving a character voice. And that's all the characters in a book. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the things that I'm trying to key in on when I prep a book and actually try and gloss over some of the sort of heavier emotional things, because that part I do want to be kind of raw and have that feeling of the first time. So um, the prep for me is about learning the characters. The read for me is about immersing myself in their emotional journey. I love that. That's really, I think that's um, maybe unique audio history. I mean, maybe not. There's so many actors that do this, but. So what was your favorite thing about Theo Silva as a character that you brought to life? Um, I really love um, a character that is connected to the earth. Um, somebody whose job or passion before meeting this person that sets their soul aflame uh, is either related to like animals or nature because it feels like such a raw place of passion to start from. And you can sort of, that fire feels like it burns bright from the outset. D do you know what I mean? Like, um, so if I'm playing a CEO billionaire, some alpha hole, something like that, that character is so divorced from his emotional landscape that the character that he meets and falls for has to awaken all of it in him. Somebody like Theo, who has a passion for uh, a sport and animals and nature, already has that fire burning. And then when winter comes in, it's like a fucking windstorm on a fire that had stone around it that is now ready to set his whole world aflame in the most beautiful way. And so for me, it's like already starting from a place of emotional vulnerability and erupting rather than I'm a stone that needs to be cracked and inside of it, there's a glimmer of feelings. Yeah, I love how he when nobody else would like the people who i mean didn't really know her but were closest to her supposedly like even they had like preconceived notions about her motives and like who she was um and like without even knowing he just like saw her so clearly and so purely it was so beautiful I, i'm an insta love fan and i know a lot of people aren't like that but this was insta love without being what people hate about insta love you know mm -hmm. like he took his time he gave her the space he thought that she needed um and oh, when i tell you else i know that you get you've gotten many a dms and i was one of them but your dedication in the beginning like if you are a mother going into yeah. this like like the emotionalness of the the little boot on your discreet cover and then you open it and for like for all the tired moms i see like i'm not an emotional person i literally like choked up and was like oh my god like when you're a mom and how hard that is to have someone verbally say that they see you and that like your effort oh my god i'm gonna cry right now but <laughs> don't cry because if you cry i'll cry <laughs> i'm that it's person so important. <laughs> and it like it is so powerful 
to feel seen and to create a character like Theo. Oh my God. Ooh, that just so purely saw who Winter was through this brick wall that she put up for her own safety, um, for everyone else. It was just like- I think that also like what I loved about the way they connected wasn't that he was like, well, if you do this, then you'll be more likable. Or like he liked her prickly exterior. Because, like, I think that we do this thing to women, like, we as a society, and as romance readers, too, I catch myself doing it, where it's like, if we're not sunshiny, happy, smiley, we for we forgive really quickly, we trust them instantly, like, all these things that we expect from a heroine, or from women in real life, or from ourselves in real life, and he was just like, no, that's fine, you don't need to be like that, and and that was, like... I don't know. My yeah, little like, oh, out there, you know? who yeah. told her that she had to be that way. Yeah. And, you know. That, that scene that I asked you about, Elsie, that was the truest thing and the most amazing scene I think I've ever read in a book. Winter is trying to make some excuses, rightfully so, for her behavior. And she said, I'm just, I'm just in a bad mood. Like, I'm, you know, this is just too much. And being a bitch um, right now. Right. And he yeah. just, he sees her in that moment and he said, no, like you're overwhelmed. Yeah. You're exhausted. You know, he was pointing out things like why she was having a hard time with what was going on instead of her saying, I'm just not at my best right now. You just don't need to be around me. I'm just in a bad mood. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I love that so much. That's yeah. my favorite. Um, question. Did you ever think about maybe a harsher punishment for what was his name? Who <laughs> oh. text messages? You know, he just got fired twice, and I was like, "This <laughs> dude deserves the gallows." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I just like you know, I did think about it. Um, but like what? Like what? You know, in flawless. Know? Brett, like, you know, is hitting people and shit. Um, but that to me was his personality, right? Like he was just like it was me. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Um, my audio beta listener, she was like, Geoff. Anybody who spells her name like that, did you guys see that one? She was like, You had to know he was gonna be a douchebag. <laughs> but um I think that for Theo, like, and this is the thing, like for to me for Theo's personality, like he is kind of like a mature, like rise above it all, like take the high road type of person. So um, to me, he like walked into that boardroom and like said his piece. And then he was like, now I'm done with that. He, I don't, he's not like a vindictive, like spiteful type of human. So um, as much as I think we would have loved to see, I don't know, maybe I need to write a bonus epilogue where like Kip does something. Cause I think Kip might, but. <laughs> Or winter, <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> oh, I loved the family oh, redemption yeah. at the end of the book, too. I love a redemption story. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite. I do, too. So the, some of the, re I don't want to give too much away, but just some of the reconciliation that happens yeah. is Well, and that was, beautiful. Kip's storyline was hard for a couple of readers because in Flawless, he is a very different parent to the other <gasps> daughter than, you know, than he is to winter and so they were like well kip's the bad guy in this book and i was like no 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 he's not he's human and he made some real dumb choices along the way and is you know doing the best he can um but then i kind of gave him those opportunities to to pull it full circle so well, same anyway. with winter i was i did not like winter in flawless yeah well i was so <laughs> Nobody excited did, for her except book. For me, you know i mean i just beautiful. thought she's terrible how how did she do these things one but, of my favorite things that authors do is when they give us the why and like i i knew that she was unlikable and like i just liked her for the reasons she was dislikable in those other stories but i was so excited for elsie to write the why and it didn't disappoint like it's just one of my favorite things when you see characters who have these traits and the this brokenness that can come across like 
distasteful but as soon as they explain like what brought them to be that way and like their baggage it's just like ugh, it's like crack I love it <laughs> I love a redemption arc I did it in my last series too um it didn't work out quite as well people <laughs> didn't weren't quite ready to forgive him so they didn't really want the book but this one I learned from it so yeah mm. but I think that's my best book in in the last series too so anyways one of the things that's really nice about um, voicing these characters is that uh, as a narrator, I have an obligation to be as truthful to each and every one of these people as possible. And nobody thinks of themselves as the villain of a story. And so everyone is motivated by whatever it is that is moving them forward and i think maybe my favorite compliment as a performer is when somebody listens to a performance that i've given of a book after they've read it and said i disliked this character or i wasn't rooting for this guy or i hated this guy and then i heard something about the way you brought him to life that made me rethink mm -hmm. all of that. And what's nice about redemptive stories or characters that early in a series may find some new life is everybody is somewhere on their own journey and people have better days and worse days. I was thinking um, just today, actually, like uh, these guys are doing some construction where I'm working and they were really nice about it. And they were just like super kind. And when I uh, left the office, uh, I have a bunch of snacks and stuff there. And I like brought a bunch of the snacks down to them and handed them. And it wasn't because I had a nice idea. It was because they made me feel good. So like this, this like positivity was like karmically pushed in so that I then felt better. And then I was paying that forward. And sometimes you meet somebody who just stepped in dog shit, like you and they just, you know, or they just lost their wallet or whatever. And like, and so your interaction with them is informed by where they are in their day in their journey in their life. And that is never the whole story. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> No, that's 100% true. Everybody has their own story and we could all benefit from giving each other a little bit of grace. Yes. Wait, I have a question, Elsie. Are we, and it's okay if the answer is no, are we going to get an extended epilogue of Dr. Dickhead's life falling apart? Justifiably? Oh, that would be... I was I was joking in my reader group the other day. Somebody um, somebody was like, "Please tell me that you don't have a redemption arc planned for Winter's mom," and I was like, "Yeah, it's actually like an older woman romance with her and Doctor Douche." And they were like, "What?" And I was like, "I was joking. I was joking. They're both irredeemable." Um, no, I think um, I think he's I th I don't know. To me, he's just like so irrelevant. Um, I'm sure his medical career in my head is just like, um, <laughs> yeah, which is kind of like the only thing he's got going for him, right? I mean, yeah, that and a personalized license plate. So seriously, um, he had too much Jerry, like, yeah, it's not. yeah. So I don't know. Maybe I haven't touched on it, but I almost feel like um, I almost feel like I could just write like a. Like, I know I have a bonus scene already for this book, but I honestly feel like I could write another one. I feel like I could just keep writing Winter and Theo. So I don't know, maybe I actually am gonna be in um, a Christmas anthology. And so I'm gonna do a short story, like a Christmas short story. And I think I'm just gonna do five chapters, um, probably from each of the, I like writing in male POV. So I think I'll probably do um, like five chapters, like one from each of the heroes perspective at like a family Christmas kind of moment um, and include um, that. So maybe I'll mention something in the, in the Christmas story. Um, yes, I love that. I have a question. Have we, I feel like the answer is no. And obviously you won't reveal it now if it hasn't. Have we revealed the title for the next book? Yeah, the pre-order is up. It's um, it's called Hopeless. Okay, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> October thirteenth. That's so exciting. Um, 
I will be that will be on my October TBR. I usually the book, save October. The book after TBR that in the series. But the book after that in the series is gonna be called Tropeless and <laughs> she's gonna blow your mind. <laughs> it's just vibes. There's no tropes. Yeah. Yeah. It's and just vibes. You for the, sorry. It's eighty six thousand words of vibes. <laughs> Yeah, are you and narrating that one too? I accidentally called it fearless, and I was like, "Wait, it's not fearless; it's reckless." People have like, asked Wait. me to do fearless, but you know what? People call flawless fearless so much, and there oh. actually is a really cool um, documentary on Netflix called Fearless about Brazilian bull riders, um, oh and God. like oh. they actually go back to Brazil and they talk about like how it kind of brings their whole family up out of like a third world country it's a really cool documentary um and it's like chills because they're insane um like they are true like i'm like who wants to get on that ball but they do um but yeah so i just was like oh, i'm not gonna do fearless but i swear anytime like i will get messages and somebody will have like highlighted on their kindle and it'll be like you know, a sentence where it's like, in this moment, I'm speechless or something. And they're like, oh, is speechless the next book? And I'm like, no, I just used a book that, or a word that ends in less. Like, there's no secret, like, you know, code here happening. Yeah. But how amazing as an author that so many people are resonating with your story so much that they want to engage with you it's so with wrong. that. Yeah. That's so cool. As a narrator, I, I have to make it a point to try really hard not to overemphasize the book title if I say it in a book. <laughs> Just getting really dramatic about it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's like, and then I see it coming up and I'm like, that's why I love you, even if it's reckless. <laughs> well, one thing I noticed in my copy of the, the ALC I got for this audiobook is at the very end when you're saying you're saying like all the information about the book be like uh you said reckless book three in the chestnut spring series and i was like joe 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 joseph it's book four <laughs> i didn't even notice it it wasn't i forget who told me and i was like katie we gotta re-record that part <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, Cassandra, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but my job is actually to read the words on the pages in front of me. Oh. Right? Thank you're you, like, you. this was not That's fair. a mistake. That's fair. I'm not, I'm not, A, I'm not doing my own research, <laughs> and B, <laughs> I'm not editing the text. I'm not, I'm like, nope, I'm reading the words. <laughs> Yeah, Les Reed's knows. Like, Les Reed's spicy book touch said he did his job. Thank you. You're like, I just work here. Yeah, I just <laughs> I work know, here. I do what I'm told. So does Audible, by the way, who is here right now. You, I saw that. that. Crazy. Hey, Audible, are you still here? Are Whoa. you having fun? Well, I know I don't want to keep anybody too long. Oh, Audible is still here. Um, but Joe, do you have something you might want to read for us? To I give can. a little teaser about this audiobook. Um, yeah, I can do that. I need a I need a second because I've been drinking uh, a little bit of whiskey, so I need to drink some water. Uh, I do not. I don't ever drink when I'm working, but this is you know, bonus content. <laughs> I like that. Well, hey, Audible, how do you like all the monies I give you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How oh, is that electricity well, no, bill been treating you that I've been funding? Somebody asked me in one of my stories if I listen to my own audiobooks. Um and I a little bit. <laughs> but I listen to them more now. Cassandra and I talked about this. She did my hair at the Seattle signing, and I was like, yeah, I was listening to Flawless. Sebastian York said cunt, and I was like, I'm out, I'm done here, I cannot listen to it anymore. Um, and that's like my favorite word, so I was like, no, that's like not my favorite word, but you guessed it at my table that day. I, I made did. people guess my favorite, my favorite dirty word and come whisper it in my ear for a special edition that I had like limited editions of. And some people were like, dick. And I was like, no, please, no. So basic. Um, yeah. So I didn't used to listen to them, but the first one I listened to was um, Powerless, which was Teddy J. Bloom. So good. And 
I couldn't stop. Like, I just really, I mean, it's funny because I will like pace. I get really uncomfortable. And um, I told my producer, I start, like, I'll be listening and I'll start watching um, like raccoon videos and like, like something that distracts me a little bit from it. Um, so my algorithm on Instagram is romance books and raccoons. Like they're like eating Fruit Loops. Or like, there's this one lady and she does this like little drive-by window in her house and the raccoons come along her fence and she puts these like plates through. <laughs> Anyways, so that was like me during chapter 27 was like raccoons and that. Um, My favorite one is the cotton candy in the water where the raccoons like, oh no, I disappeared. No. Or they're like fat and they're like laying on the bed and they're like getting pickled and stuff. I'm like, I want a raccoon. Um, <laughs> I got to put a pet raccoon in a book, maybe. Um, oh. But yeah, but I do think that now that I've listened to these last two, I do think that they actually, like, change the way I write a little bit, because sometimes I'll be listening. And like what Joe was just saying about that he just reads what's put in front of him. Sometimes I'm like, God damn it, like, those words were too similar, too close together. Or things pop up that you don't notice when you're reading the words that you hear. Um, or I'm like, oh, I've used like smile too much like I hate myself now like but I mean like not actually but I am kind of hard on myself when I listen to it it's almost um it's like a learning exercise a little bit too I think so learning that advice given to authors often to read your words out loud just yeah. so you can see if there's you know too many dialogue tags or a certain word or too many words that all start with similar sounds but even then, like sometimes when you've read the book, like, you know, by the time I get to that point, I've probably read it through like five or six times. It's like you almost just, your brain doesn't absorb it quite the same way. Um, yeah, see, Jiffy K just said, I always say, I wish I could hear our books before we publish. I think you catch so much more. And I think you do, mm -hmm. um, even though it's like a little bit painful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Not God for Joe reading, reading it. <laughs> the least painful thing. It's not a narrator thing. I think it's probably just like actors watching themselves like on TV or something, right? It doesn't, I, I'm not embarrassed about my spice. I just like, it's sometimes even just like the personal. The yeah, it's, it's just like for you. Um, yeah. I studied and never ask me to sing. Okay. It, it puts me on the spot, but I studied opera for like seven years. And whenever <laughs> I hear recordings of myself singing even though people are like wow i'm like stop stop yeah. i yeah. cannot yeah. it makes me cringe so hard yeah yeah joe do you ever listen back at any of your recordings not an entire book because you probably don't have time for that but do you ever go back to listen to yourself uh sure i mean i think it's an important part of uh getting better every time it'd be the same thing i think as like a baseball player watching his at bats from a previous game uh what's working what's not um the more information you have about your own instrument and the way you're using it the more effective you can be using it moving forward hey elsie uh my favorite word is copacetic <laughs> it's kind of like cunt <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, and, uh, it, what I what I love about the word okay, is that good. it's sorry. It I'm has saying. that it has the hard cur sound, which is fan. Yeah. It's got a couple of those hard cur sounds, which is fantastic, yeah. uh, and it's a beautifully complicated sounding word that means something so so. so everything is okay, and uh, yeah. so I've always just found that word to be like I'm just like that's so good. <laughs> Next book you narrate, Joe. I'll put it in there for you. See if you can find it. <laughs> yeah. Joe, to pay you a compliment too. I mean, I listen to a lot of different narrators, and I do think you are probably at the top or near the top for your ability to handle hard consonants in words and the crispness that you deliver those sounds mm -hmm. is just unparalleled. So. Yeah. You're I've elongated. Worked on that a lot, I'm sure. They're they're really great. The consonants are flawless on those. So <laughs> <laughs> playing with your hair. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's very kind of you to say. I think 
I, th- I think some people are mad that you asked me if I would read and now I haven't read yet. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Well, you were <laughs> hydrating the... and we got off on a tangent. So apologies. I'm everyone. hydrated. I know everyone wants to hear Joe. You're, You're good. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I, if people ask me about this book, I will tell them that chapter 27 is my favorite chapter. Um, and a lot of people will think that it's the second half of chapter 27 that I like the most. And the second half of chapter 27 is a third as powerful without the first half of chapter 27. The fact that Elsie was brave enough to keep this whole thing in Theo's POV and the fact that she was able to put these two incredibly powerful human experiences together um is for me what makes this chapter so amazing so i want to read just a small section of the first half of chapter 27. i sense the weight of people's gazes as i practically chase winter through the room my long assertive strides gain ground behind her short choppy ones she turns down the narrow wood paneled hallway it's quieter here even with my heartbeat in my ears and her heels clacking on the floor At the very end of the corridor, she goes left and wrenches on the door handle, wild eyes meeting mine over her shoulder. Theo, go away. I want to be alone. A tear streaks down her face. I know she hates to cry, hates having big feelings and big conversations, hates to feel weak or out of control, but that's too bad. Because today I don't give a fuck what you want. I growl as I yank the door open wider to accommodate my width. Get in. I push her gently into the washroom, my hand between her shoulder blades as we step into the large space with a butcher block vanity and bowl sink. I don't want you here. She hisses, wiping furiously at her face as she turns away from me to face the mirror that runs all the way to the ceiling. Would hate for happy, lovable fucking Theo Silva to get his legendary dick frostbitten by the Ice Queen. Winter, that was a joke. I lock the door while she stares at us in the mirror. Flushed cheeks, wide eyes, one hand on her heaving chest. It was a dumb fucking joke. It wasn't funny. No shit. My arms fly out and my voice booms. I made a mistake. One little mistake after everything and you treat me like I'm just another asshole and take off. It wasn't a mistake. It's a way of thinking about Summer and me that everyone does. I'll always be the cold, heartless bitch because Summer gets to be the sweet, agreeable one. And of course you see me the same way as everyone else. Why wouldn't you? Her words stun me. The heat in my cheeks creeps down my throat, a perfect mirror, tears rolling down her cheeks, both signs of our frustration. You know what, Winter? My voice is low, but it vibrates with an unfamiliar fury. I am fucking tired. I am tired of you not seeing what I see. Tired of you talking shit about yourself. I am tired of you not realizing what's right here. My palm lands heavy on my chest, right in front of you. What more do I have to fucking do for you to trust me, for you to give me the benefit of the doubt just once? She doesn't flinch at my outburst. Silent tears mar her makeup as they flow freely down her face. But she says nothing, so I keep going, stepping close enough to trail my fingers over the line of her jaw. I am not your dad. I am not your ex. I am here doing my best for you. And it seems like the more I give you, the less I get back. Why is that? Her jaw trembles as she opens it like she's about to respond, but then she shuts down, slams it shut, and looks away. I huff out a frustrated breath, dropping my hand from her cheek as I turn to leave but the loss of my touch has her spinning on her heel to face me. Because I want you, she shouts, stopping me in my tracks. And I want this. Her hand gestures frantically between us. I want us. And that terrifies me. Because what if it doesn't work and Vivi is stuck with two parents who hate each other? I know how that goes and it fucking sucks. We like each other right now. I'm finally happy. It feels safe here. I can't handle another person who hates me. 
The tears continue flowing, and she makes no move to stop them. She just stares at me after that brutally honest, raw outburst. She still holds her chin high, defiantly, no matter how vulnerable she's just been. That's all you had to say. So good. So good. That scene felt so important to me because um, I grew up with a sister who I, I love her to death. I would die for her, but she's very dramatic, always has been like with theater and just her, her personality. She was like built for the stage and she grew up with a lot of physical disabilities that kept us in the hospital all the time. And because even though it, it was just factual, she just took up a lot of space in our lives and I was happy to help her with the space that she needed. I always felt like I couldn't take up space because she needed a lot of it. And my parents were amazing. I, I love them to death so much, um, but I internalized that a lot, especially romantically. I felt like I, I couldn't be drama. I couldn't have dramatic feelings or negative feelings at all because I just grew up feeling like there wasn't space for me to have that. And it wasn't until me and my husband were married for about two years that we kind of just like had a blow up. And he's like, you never like, I, I never know how you feel. Like I never know when you're mad or upset. Like I know it, but you never share it with me. Um, and like, why do you always walk away when you feel upset and like, don't want me to see those sad sides of you. Like I want to be a part of those sad parts of you. And like, it broke me because no one had ever invited me to feel that and to be that way with them um it wasn't my parents fault they never made me feel like i wasn't allowed to it was like something that i internalized feeling like no they need a break from that sometimes because of the other kids that they have and that scene felt so special because i know what it's like to just all of a sudden feel like someone's allowing you mm -hmm. to just be who you are and feel what you feel and it's incredible so thank you for that Elsie and thank you Joe for capturing the weight of that it's important yes yeah, I think everybody talks about when you know Joe Arden's spicy scenes but for me listening to this book that was the scene that struck me um like the emotional parts and even just like Theo's dry delivery, like his, his banter, his whatever, like, um, yeah, kind of like more understated parts of it. So thank you for sharing that, Joe. That was, I mean, super impressive. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Cassandra, I love the, I love what you shared, uh, following that because for me, it's, a reminder that um, literature does the thing that it's always done for me, which is to remind me that I'm not alone. We're not alone. And I don't mind. In fact, I relish and enjoy and love celebrating the things that make people feel their biggest feelings because I have always found in books some solace for whatever I'm feeling whether it was Matilda when I was younger, you don't have to be a girl to fall in love with Matilda. Like you don't even, I didn't like, I had a great home, but I'm with, with everything about Matilda right there me at that space in my life. It was like, I, this girl gets me. I get this girl. We find our people, we find stories that are running along the same tracks as our own. And the second I've known that I'm not alone, the second I've known I'm not the only one to feel what I feel whenever I feel it, whatever it is, that's when I have the strength to to overcome it, to wrestle with it, to confront it, to face it. And books have always done that for me. So performing is nice, but hearing you share a place of your own heart from Elsie's words from my delivery is something that I'll keep with me forever. So. 
Thank you. <laughs> I love this so much. <laughs> I know. Isn't Book Talk and Bookstagram amazing? I love this space. It is. I love this whole community. It has just blown me away. The short time that I've been a part of it, you know, it's been what, eight months, but it feels like it's been a part, such a oh, deep part. Man, it's only life. been eight months? Yeah. I mean, last August, I got on TikTok in August of last year, however it meant. So no, 10 months. It's been 10 months. Yeah. Hey, Tiffany, you don't have to apologize for the amount of time that you've been here. Your feelings about this community are no less valid because you're newer to this space. I'm serious. It's important to hear that. Your earnest love for this community lives by itself. You don't have to be here a while to earn that badge. You can dive in and be committed and connected and feel it. And you don't have to apologize for the amount of time you've been here. The same thing happens in sports all the time. Oh, you're a, you're a, a dog. No, I don't know. I was born later than you. Don't hold it against me that I didn't know who the 1974 starting lineup was, bro. Like I'm here now and I love it and I feel great things about it. Mm -hmm. So it feels like you've always been here. That's Thank why I was like, oh, it's only been 10 months. It feels like it's been well, it's, just, it's changed my life. I mean, audiobooks have changed my life and have just opened That's me it. up. That's all. You don't have to I explain mean, anything else. Yeah, it's yeah, Once Jules, I, I heard the Jules first said one, in the comments, Jules it. just said, no dues to be paid, no. said Jules there, and that's perfect. Mm. And may I just say, Elsie, I know that um, it, this is not always possible because narrators' schedules and timelines and things like that, but it is such a delight for audio listeners with a simultaneous release. Like, it, it feels so inclusive. We, I, I mean, like... With you, if if it wasn't a simultaneous release, I would read it on release day anyway, just because I'm so obsessed with your books. But for people who like, this is really the only way that they're able to consume stories due to their scheduling or their lifestyle. Like um, the fact that these schedules can align, it it's always such a treat. So thank you guys for making that happen for the audible listeners of the community. Well, it's an accessibility thing too, right? The more I've like done it, the more I've met new readers who are like, no, I depend on this. So mm -hmm. I, I, I worked really hard to get ahead this far ahead. I was kind of a fly by my seat, seat of my pants. So it's really nice to be here. It's like to, to kind of like take part in the excitement around like the audio too, um, is really special. And this is really it's, well it's, on Audible. It's like, different group of people it feels like it's like a I mean not totally different but it's like it's like this own little like subculture right so it's really cool to be here I think so it feels that yeah. way I think so yeah I'm trying to read but, no, we've had there's so many, so many comments, comments that I just have not been able to keep up. up some people have been saying some incredible things um, somebody just asked about my other series what? I um actually sold it to Tantor, but it's, um, it's being produced. I think the first one will be out next month and then they're just kind of staggered through the rest of the year, but CJ Bloom is doing all of them. So we love her. <laughs> love her. <laughs> going to yeah. be a book bonanza, right? She will be. I can't wait to meet her. She's so, so sweet. Thank she you for tuning in fun. audible. Yeah. What did you say? Cassandra, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I just said thanks to Audible for tuning in. Yes, that was fun and exciting. Yes. Well, Joe, thank you so much for participating in this and doing the live narration. It was fantastic. You did a great job on this book, as you do on all your projects. I know every project is your top priority for while yeah. you're working on that project, and it shows. And listeners, obviously, have seen that and have felt that. So thank you so much for sharing the thing that you are the most passionate about with all of us. Thanks That's very me. kind of you to say, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for making the space. And Elsie, uh, thanks for asking me to be a part of 
uh, this wonderful world that you've created. Thanks for joining me. Yeah. And Elsie, thank you for being here and oh, talking course. with everyone and sharing about your book. And hopefully everybody in here will go and buy it. It's also available on some other platforms as well. And check out the audiobook. I had so many people ask me, is this a standalone or do I have to do the whole series? And I said, well, you can listen to it as a standalone, but the richness of the story with the other characters and even the main character, mm -hmm. you're going to feel that so much more. I said, so if, if you have to people. listen to this one, but then you're going to want to go and listen to the rest of them. No, I tell everybody to start from the beginning with this one because it's not as powerful unless you experienced winter from the other perspectives. Um, and you're right, technically it is a full standalone, but I think it's more powerful. Well, I tried to drop like little bits of her like in Heartless. It was like she has that moment with Willa at the hospital and then in Powerless, you kind of see her and Sloan start to hit it off. So I tried to like slowly to give you little breadcrumbs yeah so you missed that part but yeah it's it's a standalone yeah yeah but if people are wanting to listen to it i was telling them and when we get to, to it. Can we go, go ahead, when go. we get to tropeless winter actually becomes a stand-up comic and all she does is just uh short form crowd work and joke telling. it's a real turnaround it's amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's come full circle <laughs> She has. I would love that for her. <laughs> well, well, we can keep chatting, but if you guys need yeah. to run, I don't want to keep you. Yeah. I could stay here and chat all day. So we're all I know night. me too. I'm just like, I do. I don't mind staying for, I don't, I didn't overschedule myself with, with lives this week. So I don't feel burnt out like I have in the oh, past. Good. Yeah. We'll be right back though. I am about to pee my pants, so I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> um, Elsie, I didn't want to over Chandra's very um, important story that she was telling about chapter 27, but when I heard it for the first time, I started crying because <laughs> so much of that conversation verbatim have was a conversation I had with my husband about a year and a half into our marriage of me feeling very defensive and broken and him saying, I am not your dad. And I want you to believe in yourself and see yourself the way that I see you. And there was just so much in that moment emotionally that just took me back. And we've been married almost 20 years, um, but it just took me back to who I used to be. And I'm, I'm not that person. Yeah. anymore yeah so yeah. I just had such a connection to winter in that too and so much hope for her yeah I did too and especially like even like we talked about like the early mom days and just like I have never been so profoundly tired like I oh. I bartended I stayed up late I man and I have like my husband is fabulous like he is super helpful and super hands-on and I have one child and I still was just like, it's a different kind of exhaustion. Like there was a couple of days where he like walked in the door from work and I was like, handed him a baby and just left. And he yeah. was like, where are you going? And I was like, don't, don't come after me. Like just, <laughs> so probably just to spend too much money at Sephora. So it's fine, but um, yeah. Totally. It's that time of, and it, it, you know, I remember people being like, just enjoy it. It doesn't last long. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like, that actually makes me want to kill you. Like, yes. <laughs> it, enjoy it. it do you like so patronizing? And now yeah. I'm like, I wish I'd enjoyed it more. <laughs> yeah. I get it. You're just exhausted, and people are like, you know, it's fleeting. Like, just enjoy the moment. You're like, stop. I just, no. I'm excited not to feel tired every day, which I, I am a better mother now that my kids are older. Yeah. <laughs> I just, those early years and early stages where they just need all the time. It was just so emotionally and spiritually draining for me. Yeah. And so then I would feel so guilty when other mothers would just talk about how much they loved 
every moment of what they were doing. I thought, what is wrong with me? Like, this is so hard. And my sweet husband, pregnant, who was like, so much like Theo, would say, give, you know, give me the baby. I'm fine. Go. Like, go be by yourself. Go get a massage. Like, that part. <laughs> my assistant that. messaged me because she always reads, like, as I go. So I'll send her, like, a few chapters. And then if there's anything that she's like, yeah, I don't love this. Like, just kind of, you know, general story feedback. And I think that after the scene where he's, like, <laughs> sends her for a massage and is, like, cleaning and, like, whatever, she all the only thing she wrote back was thanks i hate my husband now <laughs> i was like sorry <laughs> so funny yeah. i actually sent elsie a photo of this but yes the, so the scene where she wakes up and he's in the crib with vivi Aww. i just like i sent her a picture of my husband in the pack and play with my son when he was like Eat with five like months old. Broken. I was like, is he okay? <laughs> Seriously, my husband is like just shy of six foot. And it wasn't even like the he rectangular. The <laughs> yes, it, it wasn't even like the rectangular ones. It was like a fully square one. So you see him just like curved around my son and his feet are like bent. <laughs> but it's so sweet. And he was passed out. They both were. And so I just like snapped a shot from above and it's just one of the sweetest photos. So as soon as I read that part, I was like, I've seen that and I know the emotions that come with like yeah. seeing this the father of your child. Yeah. Just like yeah. he he couldn't take it and he's like, I will get into this cramped space okay, for please, your husband is so sweet. Cassandra did my hair when we were at the siding in Seattle. And she came to my room and then her husband was there with her and he was like, got us all set up in my room with your stuff. And then he was like, I'm going to go get you a coffee. What can I get you? Went to Starbucks, come back, comes back. He's like, I brought food. I didn't know if maybe you would be like a little bit hungry. And like, so I was just like, as if this guy is so cute. He is. He's so sweet. He and he loves coming. I have things with me. I have all the same stories, but they're about me and a pit bull. And so they don't quite hit the same. Uh, I'm going to leave all of you incredible women. Thank you so much for having me in this space tonight. It has been a joy, an honor, and a pleasure. Uh, I will see you all very, very soon. Well, cuddle Thanks. with your puppy, Joe. Yes. Enjoy your she deserves it too. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night, all. Thanks for having me. Good night. Bye. Ooh, so sweet. All the talk about babies, he was like, Ooh. I know, he's like, yeah, he's like, and I'm out. <laughs> hey, but Elsie, I, I will also say this. All that, that I just said about babies, like that was the hardest, hardest thing I've ever had to do. So I don't love books with pregnancy or <laughs> secret baby tropes or any. You nailed it. You, you nailed it. It was I can't of another time like this that made me feel a little bit like, oh, I could go back to that. <laughs> like remembering my husband. Out and we're like, mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, like remembering my husband and just how he was he was Theo. He was calm, he was collective, he was supportive, he did all the things. I was a hot mess. Yeah. Like just mm -hmm. absolutely awful yeah. <laughs> and just remembering that just like oh yes this kind of makes me feel that baby thing again and then i finished the book and then it was gone <laughs> yeah totally um i it's funny because i knew that this trope like in my like gut was like this makes sense for them like this makes like i could like see the story so clearly in my mind and it's so hard to not be like Oh my god but people hate this trope people hate this trope so they're not going to want this book um but i was like i just have to stick to my guns like just go with my gut That's and funny. i i like never go on goodreads um because i it's just like not a place for authors in my mind um and yeah. but i was like okay before i do this i like need to find out like what it is that people hate about this trope so that i can try and avoid those like pitfalls so i was like looking up secret baby lists on goodreads and then going through 
the super, super brutal reviews um, to try and see like, you know, where I might end up. And actually, um, Corinne Michaels has done Secret Child, I know quite well. And so I messaged her and was like, do you have like a top three advice thing? And she was like, can I FaceTime you? And I was like, um, sure. We yeah, FaceTimed for like two hours and she pretty much helped me plot the whole book. Okay. So she is so, so lovely. <laughs> you know, people are always so worried, like, did she lie to him about it? Like that, they just hate that. So I was like, okay, so she has to have like really made an effort to contact him. Um, and you know, are they together just because of the baby or, or is there actually a connection there? So I like really tried to go through and like break those things down. Um, and I just think it made sense. And I like a good, like stomach dropping, like, oh, like moment where something happens and you're like, like yeah. you know, I, I was in the book. shower because I'll I will keep listening to my audiobooks when I'm in the shower. And so I had it up on the little shelf and it was a moment. I don't you know want to say too much, but there was a gasp, but oh, I mean <laughs> people were like, chapter eight, Elsie, really? Chapter eight, 18 months later. I was like, sorry. Wow. <laughs> wow. No, I loved the time jump. I thought that it I was great too. I didn't want to like just dredge through their time apart. I wanted to just get to the he's back and he's gonna find things out and uh, if you b read this book and believed for a second that it was actually theo who replied to her messages <laughs> like you just you knew he didn't and so i needed to know like who replied to her messages for a sec i thought maybe it was gonna be like his dad who was like you know like this is gonna ruin my son's career and like he's a I want him to like follow my legacy or whatever. Cause at this point we don't know much about his dad. We just know that, you know, his, he was a bull rider and I'm like, I don't know, maybe that's it. And I, I just, I needed to know why, cause it yeah. wasn't Theo. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. But that moment, that good. moment and that get, like the emotional pull I felt internally of what that must have felt like to her. Yeah. Right? Oh. Well, I don't know if somebody was like, why a time jump? And I was like, well, secret baby. But there was no, like, I wanted, I was like, please nobody, like, villainize her. Because I don't think she could have done, for her character and the type of person she is, anything more. Like, right. to her, that was, like, a very clear, and why would she expect anything better from anybody else, right? Like, that was exactly what she'd been trained to expect from people. So she was like, okay, I carry on then. Yep. Exactly. Um, the dollhouse? But yeah. The Oh. The doll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. I choked up a little bit at that. I did too. Like, he found it. Yeah. Also, I was like, Kip, you've had this for how long? <laughs> yeah. He was playing oh, no. with it. Just yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, I just kept it. Never thought to give it back to her ever in her childhood. Okay. <laughs> but I was so happy that. It, yeah, it was something that was mentioned before that was taken from her. And now that she has a child, she can court. I don't know. I, I thought that was a beautiful touch at the end. Yeah, that yeah, that and then like the scene where he finds out like where he comes to the front door, that one hurt to write. I actually like wrote it and I was like, uh, and then he asks, can I see her? And then <laughs> my yes. developmental editor was like, mm, we're gonna need you to like make this hurt a little bit more he just found out that he has a child and i was like oh i like almost didn't want to write it like it hurt so much that i like was like mm. but yeah it's yeah done. yeah for sure and then he was just like all in yeah and loved it yeah oh. so good and then he finally does something that i wish he had done before flawless was even created <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Wait, what does he do? <laughs> uh, he makes he's an, annou an announcement about um, moving on with his life. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Come on, you waited too long for that one, bro. Yeah, but I was, I was thankful that that was there. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I want, I wanted that there. I loved yeah. the confrontation when. Theo confronts him about 
what a shitty dad he's been to winter i'm like it was so necessary because Stood up for her yeah I, I feel like sometimes it's hard to stand up to parents you know for like because uh, on one i don't know I, I think sometimes maybe people go the route of like well it's in the past they did what they could you can't change it so like why bring it up um but I think it was important, like, even if she never found out about it for him to be like, yeah, you messed up and you gave Summer everything you didn't give to her. And that's why she is the way that she is, because you like left her to the wolves, her mom. Um, congrats. But <laughs> good. And he, I love how he felt so bad about it. Like, I needed him to feel so bad. Yes. That was the true grovel at the end, was actually yes. her dad. <laughs> yeah. Theo didn't need to grovel, but her dad did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Elsie, are you still currently writing Hopeless? Or is it finished and you're just waiting? I am almost finished. I am heading to London for a signing. Um, on, like, July 2nd, I think we fly out. So, it's going to my editor on... June 30th. So I'm super close to being done. I wanted to be done it before release because I feel like release brain is just like a totally different vibe. Mm -hmm. um, it's like exciting and like tiring and not, I'm not like in a creative headspace. Um, but I didn't finish it. <laughs> so um, I got to start again tomorrow probably is my plan. Yeah. Um, oh, I think you give yourself a whole week. Well, I guess you're running out of time. So yeah. give yourself a whole week you to just enjoy the here. reckless release. I know. Yeah. I, know, but I plan to take the two weeks off that I'm like in Europe. So that's like the like the carrot that's being dangled at the end of it. I'm like, if I do it, then I can like go to go to, you know, Europe and not have to not have to even like think about it or worry about yeah. it. Um, do you also um, have any extra stops planned for while you're there? Yeah, I think we're going to go. Um, so we're going to do London. And now because I have a like a traditional publisher there, um, we'll do like a couple things with them um, and then the signing. And then um, I have a dinner date with Anna Huang, and then we're heading to um, heading to Paris for like four days, I think, just my husband and I. So we are not taking our son. Um, so we were like, okay, he, we, we were in London um, with him last year and he was, I mean, he's a great traveler, but it's very like historical and stuff, right? So I was kind of like, he, I was like, do you want to come with us? And he was like, no. So he's hanging out with his grandparents. <laughs> yeah, he was not into it. So I was like, hey, let's go to Paris because kids won't like Paris either, right? Um, so it just felt like I love the perfect time to go check out some galleries and stuff. You have to do a bike tour while you're in Paris. That was one okay. of the coolest things I have ever done is you rent bikes and they, depending on which company you use, you get to see the back roads of Paris. You get to see things that you would not normally get to see. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, I haven't even thought about that. But especially because when you travel with a kid, like they're seven, they don't always have children's bikes or whatever. Oh, but funny. yeah, without him, that True. sounds good. Yeah. I we'll like just bike from... tours wherever I go. That's you me. like what? I like doing food tours wherever I go. So when I went to France, that's what we did. And we just went all over the city, sort of collecting food items from like, you know, the boulangerie and the fromagier and like all, all like the butcher shop, all these different places. And then we ended up at this restaurant where we like kind of put everything together and did like wine pairings and things like that. And so I fun. love that. Yeah, I'll, have to, I'll send yeah. Tiffany some pictures of me drinking champagne since we both yes. like a bubbles thing. <laughs> yes, of course. While well, you're watching the sparkling Eiffel Tower, I'll just my sparkles with me in my purse. Ah. Can you imagine? French people would be horrified. I feel like just me <laughs> sprinkling plastic sparkles into their champagne. No, uh, they would not. I will um, say though. I mean, it's it's been a while. The last time I was in Paris was in 2012. Okay. 2011. It was 2011. Um, and then I went once or twice 
previously, but I was just so thankful to the Parisians. They were so helpful. And I, I speak some French. That's what I studied in school. But we would be standing there. I mean, this is before smartphones. Twenty, But we'd have our maps trying to figure out where we were going to go. And people would approach us and speak to us in English and ask how they could help help us and figure out where we were going to go. And yeah. I think Parisians sometimes, in America at least, get a... Um, Bad rap. Have a not so kind reputation. And that was just not my experience when I was oh, there. Oh, no, mine either. But my, we were got married. Like, I got married and then, like, I went to France with my parents and my sister because it was planned before we got engaged. <laughs> but she's in a wheelchair. And not all the time, but if there's going to be a lot of walking, she can't do more than, like, half a mile. Um, and the way that they treat disabled is like just angels everywhere we went like as soon as they saw her wheelchair they were like okay. make way like they treated her so polite and like royalty Aww. like in museums and at restaurants they were very accommodating i don't think we ever encountered a rude person except for yeah. someone who tried to scam us into paying like 30 euro for a polaroid in front of the louvre i was like excuse me <laughs> That. Yeah, I will send you the name of a uh, a local coffee house in okay. Paris that tourists, yeah. at least when I was there, it was not on the radar. It was just a okay. place that locals go. We it like restaurant. Yeah, anything is good. Yeah. Wait, That's someone cool. asked a little bit back. They said, question was this theo's first world championship what happened in flawless was that different oh well he was it was a default right he didn't oh. really yeah we actually went back i'll be totally upfront. we went back and clarified it so in older versions it's it's less clear than it is now so um yeah so that was one of those things now that like the traditional publisher has picked up the books they've gone through like a whole nother round of editing for continuity and just consistency and line edits and like man i just go through sets of eyes there are still things that get missed it is so humbling i'm like why can't it be perfect um but yeah so things just get caught along the way but by the time they all start moving over into bookstores um it should be all the way that we want it to be so how many I'm different like, covers do you have you. right now <laughs> so many um okay so i feel like i've seen so many different covers and they're all so pretty you've got the the couples on the front yeah mm -hmm. the cover and models then... the mirrors so this is what I started with. And mm -hmm. then there was on all of them, the couple covers. And then there was like this real shift in the market and with TikTok of people um, not wanting them to look like man chest or couple or like so that they could read it in public and not have to worry about it. Or maybe they live in a family where or in a house with family members where like this wouldn't be okay or in a country where this wouldn't be okay. Um, and so then I was like, okay, well I'll do a special edition cover and sell it separately, which is when we did these like different mirror covers. Um, and then I got a publishing deal in the UK and, and Europe and the British Commonwealth. So basically they took all my rights. Um, Ah. And in those in those countries and just like their distribution is crazy, like to see my books in like Waterstones and stuff like that. Like I there's limitations on an indie author with paperbacks and that paperbacks are still like the most widely read like medium, um, even though like my number one selling unit would be ebooks um so they took that over and then they were like, we want to do a whole new branding. Okay, whatever. So they did these ones. I actually just got my box of them <laughs> And then now that I have the Bloom deal, which is print in North America That's only. Right. That's right. They are basically doing a play on this cover um, with a slightly different font treatment. So they'll all look like these ones. So 
slowly my versions will come out of print um and they're staggering them so that like anybody who's invested like if you have four of the mirror covers you will be able to get the fifth one yes. that was, like, the, sticking, my, that was the sticking point for me is i was like i don't want you know and a lot of people have both sets and then i was like then they won't match like and i know that bugs people so um yeah so they're gonna take them over like flawless hits bookstores at the end of august and then heartless October or no September October they're not releasing one because I release and then November December January mm -hmm. so then all the covers then these guys will be collector's editions basically yeah do you know like will they start ceasing production on the indie covers as soon as the publishing there will actually be a little bit early like I will have to pull down my copies I'm actually going to post all my um like my takedown dates so that people can order them beforehand. Um, it's usually about six weeks before and Amazon has printed enough stock that they'll probably stay in stock for a while before they like run out. So um, yeah, so it will be, there'll be a stagger, but I'll like between, you know, Instagram and my newsletter and Facebook, um, those are kind of like my main, I mean, TikTok is like aesthetic reels, but then those are my main like information. Mm -hmm. um, sharing platforms so make sure you know over and over again so there are no broken hearts <laughs> so go to instagram and make sure you're following Elsie, yes. and then to sign up for her newsletter it's probably in her bio yeah. oh yeah the newsletter, newsletter like the best it has everything still left we we started talking about babies <laughs> yeah he was like and okay. he decided um, i don't have but, okay so talking about babies. books so I just got both of these because I'm going to book Bonanza and I'm going to be helping Abby a little bit at her table. Look at this. Why? Why publishers? I know. <laughs> Why are Stop they it. not? Stop it right now. It's the same series. It's the same. If they're in a series. Why? Seems Why? like something you'll have to bring up to Abby. Oh, I did. She said people are rioting. It, <laughs> it bothers her too. It's brutal. Well, they, Is that something you don't have control over? I think it depends on the publisher. I think because mine is so hybrid and Bloom is like, like their whole thing is that they're going to work with indie authors is like they're a lot more flexible. So they asked me, hey, can we do, what was it? It's whatever, it's whatever size Anna's books are. So they wanted to go this size and yeah, I'm, a little bit taller and, and a little bit wider. I think it's like 0.25 on each side. Oh, someone came in and they're like 0.25. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Kristen. Um, and I was like, no, I want them to, <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> I want them to be the same size. Sorry. So, but if I had started off with, it's not anything against the size. I just think yeah. that like, people like to have like an LC shelf and then they like them to all be, you know, I also, I'm like, this is a nice size in my hands, five by eight, I feel like. Yeah, it's so good. I feel like. I don't actually take the books, so I don't know. On my shelf. I collecting them. I like collecting them now when I get them, it makes me really happy. I have a stack on my floor. I got this one, but I haven't read it yet. I got the oh, straight it's so edge. good. It's okay. so good. If you like fantasy, I love that's, fantasy. that's I love one that me and my husband listened to the audiobook for together. And, um, oh my gosh, stupid. <laughs> but my husband and I, we just loved it. It was, yeah, I'm excited to read it. I've been like, saving if it. If you grew up reading like Hunger Games, Divergent, Aragon, like any of those, YAs that sort of just sucked you in. It felt like that, but just like maybe a little next level because there is spice, but not, it's like slow burn. It's not till the end. Slow burn though, yeah. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah, just be prepared. Cause I know if people said it's spicy. And so I was kept waiting yeah. for it and waiting and it was like 70%. And I'm like, how long is this I going to take? <laughs> like for me, I, I would rather have like two really good sex scenes than like yeah, yeah, yeah. Sex the whole way through. I just like, I like, I, that's what keeps me going. I'm like, when are they going to do it? When are they going to do it? That's what keeps me like flipping pages. So, mm -hmm. Tiffany, yeah. were you also like a little taken aback by that fade to black in the beginning <laughs> of Reckless? 
Oh, in the very beginning, I was like, yes. I DM'd her and was like, Elsie. But then, you know, because I'm like, hey, hey, one night stand, we're starting this early. And then it was just done. And I thought, this is like what the she's next doing. day. We're not going to know until the end of the book. <laughs> you called it. You called I it. I did. I knew me like, oh, we're, we're going to get to hear oh. that. We're going to hear it at some point, but she's going to make us wait all the way. I felt personally attacked. That was, was, it was worth it. It was so worth, worth it. it. And they kept like hinting at the flashbacks of like things that he had said. It like, was such memories of it, and I was like, healthy. they keep remembering it, but they haven't told us what happened yet. I kept like going back and adding, like especially once I'd actually written the scene. Then when I did my read through, I like pulled out some quotes from it and like you know put them through. Um, but I. I don't know. I was actually a point of conversation with some author friends of being like, should I, shouldn't I? And, and I just felt like, I just felt like I, I love the tension and the not oh. knowing. And if I put it there, then you know what their dynamic is. Whereas right. like making, and then somebody commented the other day, I think it was in my reader group. Um, and it was like Elsie edging us like when we didn't even know we wanted to be or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's like someone says, I hate slow burns, and then they're just devouring this book because yeah. Yeah. it was the right balance with slow burns. Yes. And it yeah. was. It was it was perfection. It really Thanks. was. I do really love this one. So And I loved her like politely asking to be disrespected because it's like, yeah, I get it. Like I I'm a feminist and I, you know, I want to be respected and on the same level, but like in the bedroom, can we just like a little bit, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, she asked for it, right? Yeah. Like, it was like, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think she was, everybody was like always kind of tiptoeing around her. So it was like a, a spot for her to just be like, just treat me like I'm not who I am, you know? And that um, Joe Arden and the way he helps deliver those lines and that sound clip. I don't remember, I was watching raccoon videos. <laughs> I'm in the kitchen cleaning, listening to it, and I knew that it was coming, or there was something spicy that's gonna happen. I, I actually like listening to it. Like I get super, tight, and um, Catherine Cowles and I are super tight. And I took like a, a screen recording of the part when he's like, "Like you want to be what is it, my pretty little slut tonight?" And I like recorded it, and then I sent it to her, but I didn't say anything, and she was like, "Ah." Why is Joe Harden screaming at me? My volume was all the way up. You didn't <laughs> tell me what this was. She was like, he just called me a slut really loud. It was like, so funny. this is from my book. Don't worry about it. Because her books are like not nearly as spicy. So we like to like yeah. joke with each other um, about it. I keep being like, Catherine, you need to put the C word in one of your books. And she's always like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Wow. Joe Arden, he's top dog for yeah. sure. Kim he's Frilla, I saw a literally. comment. You finished the audiobook today. Did you love it? Mm -hmm. Good night. I, I mean, seriously, everyone that's listening to this right now, if you've never tried an audiobook before, <laughs> this is a great one to start with. It's fantastic because the story is so rich. Mm -hmm. And Savannah and Joe. Yes, Joe left already. So sorry. He, he left he left a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, as soon as we started talking about ovaries and wombs, he was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> He just got quiet and I was thinking like, mm, he's probably, he's probably <laughs> waiting for I'm nothing to, to contribute it. to this conversation. Yeah, he's like, I have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> he loves his puppy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, audio is the best. I mean, oh, Sebastian York. Sebastian Elsie York. has used him as a narrator. Yeah. Oh, at the Joe Arden event, that Sebastian York intro. That was awesome. He so good. left a, uh, like a voice memo that mm -hmm. about Joe, but Joe had not heard it yet. Mm -hmm. So cute. Little Basically, competitive like introducing, battle. Like, have. And welcome, Joe, the second best narrator in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so good best i love sebastian or he is also a one-click narrator for me i know like i love 
his TL Swan work and oh, uh, just he's he's good. I love his, him. Uh, his comedic timing in some of the like funnier books and dry like the tl swan books especially the takeover i mean oh, the takeover can i tell you people what? who love the takeover are obsessed with the o2 i think he's been lumped in with like tristan uh-oh uh-oh she says sebastian york was lumped in with who Oh, no, that Theo has been, like, kind of lumped in with, like, the Tristan Miles sort of. Gotcha. Okay, understood. <clears throat> um, off to the races will be out uh, in July. I don't remember the date right now. It's on Barnes & Noble for pre-order right now, I think. Um, and it is C.J. Bloom and Tim Payne. Okay, and so it is C.J. Bloom and Tim Payne. Uh -oh. and Who got a phone call? Who got a phone call? <laughs> Sandra, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so CJ Bloom and Tim Page. And then um, book two is Violet uh, Eaton and Cole. And that's CJ Bloom and Troy Duran. And is it Duran or Dur Duran? Duran. Duran. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then it's like Tim and CJ for book three and CJ and Troy for book four. They just like swapped back and forth. So less choice with the, with the public than when I do my own. So, Could you, yeah. You got to meet CJ in Denver, right? I did. I have my books signed by her too, actually. Aww. Um, but it was funny because I met you just as I was like, I was so chaotic at that signing because they lost my bags and our flights got canceled. It was just like, my assistant took me to H&M and I was like, I don't know what I want to wear. Like oh, anyways, no. when I got there and I was like, I don't know. I didn't, it was like a author narrator mixer and you were in the hallway, I think. Yes, I was in the hall because I wasn't invited into that particular <laughs> event. So I was just out in the hallway waiting. I should have just been like, this is my narrator tiffany <laughs> like just i don't think they were checking people that carefully oh. but well, I got i'm in a there. rule follower so i was just waiting my turn i got in there and i was like i don't really know anybody um none of my like author friends were at that signing and so i like saw cj and i like always after i like finish a book i send like a thank you note to the narrator and so I had done that with her and then her and I just ended up emailing and chatting and kind of like hitting it off. So she knew that I was going to be there. So I like saw her and she was just like totally took me under her wing for like the whole night. It seemed like she introduced me to people like I was like, oh, oh my man. God, I have like a safety blanket. She's, She's wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. I love her energy when she was in your live with Maxine. It was mm -hmm. just like, I don't know, it just felt like a big old sleepover. Yeah. Yes. She's so positive and she yeah. just wants to share that positivity. No, she talks all the time about women need to empower women and support women and don't gatekeep. And this isn't a competition and we need to lift each other up. And I can be around that all day long. I love it. Yeah. I know. I can't wait to meet her. <sighs> yeah. Love her. Yeah. She's awesome. Okay, wait. Okay. So are you going to Reader's State Denver next year? Do you know, or are, are you allowed to say or want to say where you think you'll go in 2024? Yeah, it's kind of up in the air right now. Like there's so many, there's so many to choose from. Um, they are doing one in Banff again, like the Canadian Rockies or like Calgary, but close to there. So um, I'm, I think I'm going to do that one because it's like July 27th and you know, it's a great time to go see the Rockies and it's like close to where Chestnut Springs is. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that one. Um, I told the organizers um, for Love in Vegas that I would do Vegas next year. Okay. Um, and so I'm. those are my two for sure. I have a couple, like I'm thinking maybe one in the spring. It just totally depends on like other, like, like deadlines and like life stuff too, right? Yeah. So I'd love to do Book Bonanza, but um, they're also just like, tiring and a lot of work and they're so fun like it's like so exciting but then you get home and you're just like well <laughs> like you're just yeah. like a couple days to recover so yeah i can imagine. i mean even as someone just going for the fun and not the work it's exhausting yeah, yeah. 
Well, and like after Seattle, my finger peeled. I had this like blister on it from signing. Yeah. Oh. So, but it's good. Uh, I love them. It's fun. I, I know cramping because you're just constantly all day. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, a lot. But it's amazing. It's also so exciting because like this yeah. is a job that you do, you know, in your office by yourself. Like you don't have any coworkers. Everything is online. So it doesn't always feel super real. And then you go to a signing and you're like, oh no, like there's a lineup of people here to see me. And um I'm so excited to see it's, you in the chat. Surreal. With you. Like it, it's like the physical representation of all that stuff that you just don't even totally soak in sometimes. So um it's kind of magical that way. Uh, Book yeah. Bonanza is in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I think it, this year it's next weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys yeah, it's next weekend. weekend. It's almost yeah, always weekend. in June, right? It's almost always in June. And it's in Grapevine this year, which is just a little bit outside of Dallas. I think it's usually, well, I don't know how long it's been around. It was started by Colleen Hoover yeah, um, as a fundraiser, and that's where she lives. It's been at least two right two, two, two or three yeah but it sells out in like less than five minutes i know i i honestly i can't believe i got a ticket <laughs> no i know i was so excited like i seriously like a, a month ago was like i'll I'm gonna go. I don't have a ticket, but I'll just hang out. Everybody's like, I'll be your assistant at Book Bonanza. I'll be your assistant at Book Bonanza. Like everybody just like wants that like golden assistant ticket, right? Of course. Yeah. So well, I almost felt like it wasn't even fair to at because I was going, you know, to be like a hairstylist for authors. And I'm like, I can't offer to be someone's assistant if I'm also going to be like a stylist for these people because then I I can't dedicate all my time to one person if I'm offering this for other people. So right. I couldn't even do that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to take your assistant ticket if I can't be there hundred percent for you. So it was just, a, I was going to go and I'm like, at least I'll be at the Gaylord and they have a killer pool. I can just hang out at after I do hair for authors and then maybe hang out at after parties. But then Tiffany came in clutch and was like, someone in the group is selling their ticket. And it was just, it was meant to be. You guys are going to have so much fun. And it yeah. worked out. Okay. Yeah, I have to um, I saw somebody ask, can we hear anything about, um, can we hear anything about the next series? Um, and I, I don't want to share too much about it yet because it's still kind of like in its inception, but I think um, the hero from book one you haven't necessarily no you haven't met but he has been briefly mentioned oh in other books um and you will meet him in hopeless just like a little sneak peek of oh, yeah. hero one so it'll be like a loose a loose tie-in kind of the way that like the eaton's tied in with like violet um yeah. then it's like another little okay. another little link there so maybe i'm just forgetting did we meet the female lead for hopeless yes okay we just don't know who it is yet um i'm gonna do a blurb reveal oh but you know what it's in the back of the ebook uh hopeless is the is the last book and the heroine is bailey who is the waitress bartender well bartender at the at the bar so she's like kind of dropped into a couple scenes but we don't really like know her know her okay yeah. You know, she was there during like the ride there, wear the hat, ride the cowboy scene. No, she was there for the milk drink scene um, in Flawless. Like she was the girl who was kind of nervous about bringing the drinks over. <laughs> that's right. I forgot okay. about that scene. That's so good. Yeah. There's <sighs> five books in Chestnut Springs, just mm -hmm. the five. I then I'm like, I need a fresh landscape to I can't keep all this stuff straight about them. You guys. I totally get what you were saying though about enjoying keeping like the landscape close to home. When I read books that are set in the Pacific Northwest, it doesn't matter what, it instantly feels more special to me because it's home, it's there. And like, I can imagine if you're writing a story and like you're chasing more of that feeling versus like yeah. the 
the right formula for a story, it helps to have a familiar atmosphere. So I totally get why you would want to continue writing Canadian yeah. pieces. Yeah. So I'll just pick another. It's actually the the small town um, that it'll be set in. We visited in Powerless, so it's Rose Hill, mm -hmm. um, which is where Jasper and Sloane play pool and stay at the stay at the hotel. I guess it's a hotel. Yeah. Um, so that'll be the town, and it's like based on a town the that I vacationed at as a child. Yeah. Sorry. The crawl to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that book. The hotel. The hotel. That happened there, right? That was where that. Uh, no, at the ranch, but it was the. Um, no, because nothing happened at that hotel. Really? I thought that was Nothing where happened. I was waiting for one room. bed. They had to sleep in the same bed. There was only one bed. And it was oh, at the man. lake where he, she, they go into the water and like, and then it's on the drive because they, they, they kissed. They, yeah, they almost kissed in the lake. Yeah. And then it's, yeah, driving in the snowstorm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The water oh, bottle. Oh, yes. The little the panic, water bottle scene. panic moment. Oh, the, I loved him so the, much. And the buddy, too much buddy's best. And the, the you're my person what text message. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bo's book is set in um, is set in Chestnut Springs, mostly on the ranch and then in the town. But this will be the the series after will be. Is that a real beer? Rose Hill. <laughs> no, I just made it up. But I got to get somebody to like design the label for it. I think that would be so it's, funny. Wouldn't that, that would be funny? Be, and you started like having them at like your signing. Signing. a koozie. Signing what like if it's like a beer with koozie? The, so you with can the slide that one on your. Dress. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be so. I am excited. Well, thank you so much. Too. I feel like it's going to be emotional. Yeah, oh, he yeah. is. It'll he's be... gone through a lot, and I'm. I'm excited to hear. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The PTSD will probably be very real. Yeah. yeah. Um, Harvey doesn't get a book, but in my when the Bloom editions come out in bookstores, I've written um, a bonus chapter for each one of them. So you'll get one Harvey POV chapter in the back of each of those books. Um, Harvey. So that's the that's the draw to the new Bloom versions. So there's like a little just like tidbit at the end of him going through what he's going through. So yeah. I that still think sense. about the do you have reading key? <laughs> <laughs> that was so that great. Was so it's really so good. good. It's so good. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much. I'll see you for having you. With you. Yeah, this was fun. Yes. So fun. I loved it. Yeah. I'm glad you've had a good well. weekend it's and a an good amazing weekend. Yeah. Good release and hopefully that momentum will just keep going the more that we keep talking about it. So <laughs> And if oh, we don't tail, chat before baby. then, enjoy your July <laughs> trip to London. I love the tail baby. The tail baby. The tail baby. <laughs> Harvey, telling jokes that none of us can. I <laughs> loved that. It was so great. What a perfect way to end this. <laughs> yeah. Watch out for those tail yeah. babies. All right. Well, you two lovely ladies, have a great night. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yes. And uh, yeah, go get reckless. Go get okay. it. Read it. Listen. Thanks, ladies. Have a good night. All right. Bye. Bye.